channel everyone. Today I'm going to be breaking down two companies that couldn't be more different, Databricks and Palantir. I've learned a lot over the last uh, month using Foundry and learned a lot over the last few weeks using Databricks. I'm going to share that knowledge with you. Uh, spoiler alert, or no spoilers, but let's get into it. I didn't include any hands-on usage because I wanted to fast track this video. <clears throat> and also I thought it bore the crap out of you with just comparing the platform tools. So we're just going to go through a feature matrix and look at all the various um, differentiators by category. In my mind, both these companies um, are really addressing different things. And you'll see by the end of this video why that is. Uh, both excel in different areas and have key differentiators in different areas and aspects. Um, and both are meant for, for different sort of use cases um, and different types of people. So, uh, and while there is overlap between them, there are, there are very much huge differences. Um, so I th really hope you get a lot out of this video. It clarified a lot of things for me about people all constantly doing this like Snowflakes versus, Databricks versus. So hopefully this will be the last versus video I ever do because I think it'll be clear by the end of this video how these two companies are totally differentiated from one another and how they're really ultimately solving different problems for different people. So get ready people for Databricks v Foundry. All right, Foundry versus Databricks, head to head. <laughs> Originally cut this video, I had all this like hands-on usage and it was like well over an hour long. And I said, let's just cut the bullshit and get to the part that the viewers want to see. All right, head to head, starting with Compute. Uh, both provide a silo offering. They do this with uh, runbooks for your cloud provider. What you'll do is you'll select your cloud provider. You'll get a um, essentially a cloud formation template to spin up the stack. That stack will be running inside your AWS account. The advantage of that is it's close to your data and you can provide any kind of security, additional security permissions over the cluster that you want. Uh, so that's, and in Palantir with Foundry, that's typically part of an enterprise offering. Um, but the advantage of this is that your compute is as close to the data as possible. Um, and also that you have full control over the cluster. You can provide any kind of network boundaries you want, isolation that you want. It's totally up to you. Um, and to my knowledge, only Foundry supports like a multi-tenant offering, right? So like the um, Foundry for Builders program, I believe all of those are multi-tenant SaaS instances and um, none of the infrastructure runs in your account, right? This is all provisioned infrastructure from Palantir. You don't have to manage anything. You just log in and you're good to go. Um, so to my knowledge, only um, Palantir supports that. Now Databricks is sort of a hybrid in that the online UI that allows you to um, code and submit jobs that is running in Databricks' uh, stack, to my knowledge, as far as I know, um, the it, it spins up a job cluster essentially inside your account. So it's sort of a hybrid, um, but a true multi-tenant SaaS offering that's only offered by Palantir. Uh, elastic, so both are elastic. Both can scale up or down to meet um, the requirements of your workloads if you enable it. Um, Foundry has a whole set of um, dynamic allocation profiles that you can select from for your, your code repository and you can attach that in there to say, hey, dynamically allocate based on min and max or use dynamic resource allocation. There's a few there's a few different ways you can configure that. Same thing in Databricks. So you can select the ways in which you want the cluster to scale up or down and which profiles are associated or which uh, like EC2 instance profiles are gonna be associated with that, with that job and that scaling. So both are really powerful options there. And all both are available in all regions, right? So with the silo model, you can spin it up in any region you want. Um, the multi-tenant SaaS offering is restricted, so I don't believe that is all regions. Last time, I think there was there was maybe eight regions, six regions. It might have been six regions. I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, you'd have to check with your Palantir representative to see which regions um, the multi-tenant SaaS offering is in. But they support all regions through the silo model. To bookend uh, the elastic capabilities too, um, both. Palantir or both Foundry and Databricks have their own methods for persistent build environments, which plays into this elasticity. Um, Databricks, in my opinion, is a little bit superior in that it offers you the opportunity to take advantage of custom Docker containers that you can bake your dependencies into, and that can make. And they also have pre-warmed Spark environments where your jobs can be submitted if you if your cluster is still active, and that de is determined by settings that you use through the platform. Palantir <clears throat> maintains artifacts of your build 
that include all of the dependencies so don't have to be reinstalled. And that ensures that um, your, your builds are faster when executed down the road as part of your scheduling. To my knowledge, they don't have um, support for custom Docker images. The ability to keep a warm Spark environment around, I think that would be configurable when you're working with the enterprise offering, but I haven't um, found anything in the documentation about it. But uh, in any case, there are some slight difference there in their Elastic capabilities. Storage, um, both support Parquet. Um, Parquet is sort of the go-to format um, that a lot of people are using in their data lakes when working with Spark. But only Databricks supports Delta, and Delta has some unique capabilities, including ACID guarantees. It also does automatic Z ordering, automatic column skipping, and a whole host of other ranges of uh, features that really make your pipelines ultra performant and ultra reliable, um, or not necessarily ultra reliable, but it makes writing the data ultra reliable. Um, they also open sourced it recently, so it's not no longer proprietary. So the way it used to work is only part of Delta was open source, and then to get the best parts, you had to buy Databricks. They've recently open sourced the whole thing, so if Palantir wants to incorporate Delta, they can. I'm told that they have similar capabilities, though, through Foundry, like ACID guarantees. There's a um, patent I'll leave a link to in the description of the video. It describes how they do ACID guarantees in Foundry. There wasn't any public documentation um, that, I could, that I could find, so I couldn't really dive deep into the capabilities. Um, and also that you know they have similar capabilities when it comes to structured streaming, even though... Um, you know, in, in Databricks, you'll be using Spark structured streaming. I, I'm not exactly sure how it's done in Foundry. Again, there wasn't links to the public documentation, but I'm told you get the same guarantees that you would through Delta in Foundry. So um, both equi pretty equivalent there, although I'm still going to give the edge to Databricks. And a lot of that is due just to the public transparency, access to the information um, about about the additional benefits that, would, that are inside Foundry. And the only actual documentation I could find were related to the asset guarantee, so I'm not going to include any stated additional um, benefits that I can't find public documentation on. Security, both are highly secure, right? So like both have fine grained ACLs down to the row and column level uh, to, to allow to, you to hide data from people who shouldn't have access to it. Both have extremely advanced network security options. Both are extremely compliant, have numerous certifications, uh, including FedRAMP. So um, it's just Foundry on the government side definitely would get the edge because it does have higher security clearance and more certifications than Databricks on the government side. So if you're in the government, Foundry would definitely be the platform I'd be looking at versus Databricks where I wouldn't get the compliance out of the box and I would have to demonstrate compliance to a compliance officer. That wouldn't be ideal. Um, so definitely in the government side, but in the commercial side, both stack up evenly, in my opinion, for any use case that I'm going to be considering. Cost, definitely to Databricks. <laughs> it's, we all know this already. Databricks has a free trial. It has pay as you go, and it's affordable. Palantir does not. Right? So like, none of those things exist in Foundry. Um, so I, I think, and, and this is where it hurts them in sales because the fact that a developer there's a free trial, right? That means every developer can go and learn this platform. I'm learning it for free and basically for free. I'm ba barely paying anything in my own personal AWS account. Been on it for a couple of weeks. I've managed to build some pipelines. And that's really advantageous from my point of view because before I go to make a case as to why we should or should not use this platform, I have hands-on experience. I could get certified in it ahead of time. So when I'm making a decision with the stakeholders, it's actually like I'm, I'm a subject matter expert, right? Like I'm not um, you know, theorizing about what the platform's capabilities are. So that's huge from an engineering point of view. And until Foundry, until Palantir can do that, I think they're gonna have a really hard time uh, making inroads in the SMB space. Uh, making inroads in like startup spaces, high tech companies that are startups because they they're gonna want to kick the tires, right? So this is a huge one. This is another one where where, where Palantir um, should really take notice because it could be something that really hinders growth, just like Delta. And just like Delta, it's entire it's a, it's a relatively easy thing to support, right? So like unless there's something deeply hidden from us that is wrong with the platform that wouldn't allow um, these things to be done, it, it really makes you wonder like, why aren't you doing it? And it's a really low lift to do it. So totally surmountable, just like Delta. Uh, it's just one of those things that I can't for the life of me figure out why they're not doing it. Change management. Now this one definitely goes to Palantir and it's a big one too. This is, this is like right up there with Delta in my opinion, because it saves you from a lot of distributed systems nightmares. So both platforms support notebooks. Okay, that's all good. Palantir supports a full-blown online IDE though, and with autocomplete, like code completion, with um, you know full support for your project settings and access to your Gradle files and 
all that great stuff, right? And you can manage dependencies. Um, you can manage dependencies in Databricks too. So, but Palantir is a full blown IDE. So that is actually pretty cool, and it has integrated testing built in. Um, both platforms support Git integration. Now, Git integration means you can bring your own version control system. You can actually hook it up to the platform. So if you want to integrate your own GitHub repos or your own your own change management tools, you can. And you want to integrate that with your own CI CD system, you can. Both platforms do support that. However, that's a distributed systems nightmare, dude. Like integrating um, a workflow that spans between two different systems. And when they get out of sync, what do you do? That's a hard problem to solve. And so it shouldn't be understated that the remediation and triage of integrating two platforms to do one workflow, especially one as critical as change management, that's not something that you really want to be doing all the time. Um, so the, the integrated CICD and Foundry is huge. Plus, it's a lot of work. Like People think, oh, CICD is not that much work. Dude, Like that's what my teams do. We're, I manage infra teams. We build technology and tools that help developers deliver product. Don't tell me that, in, that CICD is not a big deal or hard to do. It most certainly is. I have a team of expert engineers, and that's all they do. So uh, it's a huge advantage for Palantir. The effect on cost can't be understated. So, and also to have the online IDE and everything working as part of a single workflow where you can do, and in Palantir, I can do pull request review. I can, you know, issue pull requests. I can do all my branch management security settings on my repo right there, right? All of my project settings are right available to me on the online IDE. That can't be understated how important that is. And let's also not forget that like companies are spending a lot of money to create virtual workspaces for companies using everything from code, GitHub code spaces to pay products that uh, that don't that solve the it works on my machine problem and also makes the developer's um, laptop replaceable without like massive downtime right it really changes the game and like what type of laptop the developer has to work on too so there are huge advantages here and definitely it goes to, to foundry data modeling this is where things also get interesting so both platforms have an integrated data catalog both platforms support a feature store which you can bind to models however um, only Foundry supports an ontology, right? And so what is an ontology? People get really confused. Well, like for me, I'm just going to talk about the features that make up the Foundry ontology. So it has, it, basically these are data sets or data models that have relationships and behaviors, right? So it's a graph, number one. The edges in the graph can define things. And you can also attach behaviors to an ontology object, meaning an event occurs in the system and you want that ontology object to respond to that event. Whether that's data changing in the data set or some event upstream, your ontology object can actually take actions. And those are programmable by, the, by an engineer. Um, the graph is also configurable by the engineer. There's also native write back in ontologies with phonograph. What is, why is that important? Well, remember I was saying your ontology object wants to respond to events in the system. Those events can include like writing to ERP systems to trigger orders, right? So these are con these are things that actually mimic real world organizations, real world individuals, real world factories and behaviors of machines. So so this is actually a really powerful differentiating feature, and I think it's one of the main reasons companies love Foundry is the ontology. It is you can build an ontology like system at, on top of Databricks, but dude, the engineering work is tough. All right, so just understand this is a huge advantage for Foundry, um, and one of the things that I love most about the system personally. Again, they, the uh, Databricks doesn't have native write back, though you can build write back yourself. Write back is challenging to manage, right? There's a lot of ways developers can fuck up write back and get it wrong. So having that out of the box in Foundry, that was like one of the first questions I asked them. Like, write back's a solved problem, right? And they're like, yeah, it's a solved problem. You don't have to do any work. So that was really cool. Uh, software to find data integrations. Uh, that's SDDI. These are intelligent um, uh, ingestion engines that Foundry or that Palantir built using machine learning and, heuri and a combination of machine learning and heuristics. So they can understand a data set that's in an ERP system or some third party system and know the type of data that's in it. And then infer from that, like actually build an ontology for you, building the data pipeline all the way out to these ontology objects. That's what HyperAuto is, right? So if you go look at a demonstration of HyperAuto, it's mind blowing. Like the fact that they can just pull in that data from all these different various data sources and then build a system to manage um, car part inventory and do auto rebalancing of the supply chain directly from the data without an engineer doing anything is pretty cool, right? So software defined data integrations are an advanced feature that only exists in Foundry to my knowledge. How good is it? I don't know. I can't speak to it. I haven't used the feature. I've only seen the demos. I don't know how deep the integrations go. 
I don't know what types of data they can analyze, but the hyper auto demo is pretty compelling. Data pipelines, <clears throat> this is also an interest where things get interesting. Both have decla declarative syntax, meaning you, you write with decorators usually, they're expressive, they sort of talk about what you want to do as an engineer without having to expressly, expressly like write every line of code to do it. So both fully support that. Both are good. You know, Databricks' is, um, decorators are really great. I, I like the way building Delta Live uh, data pipelines works. It infer it's really easy to get a pipeline written very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> that said, it's not as robust as Palantir's offering for the for the syntax. Sorry, uh, for the, the for the declarative like the decorators. Palantir is a much better API and a more robust API to do a lot more than what Databricks can do currently. This is also an area where they're really far ahead. Like Databricks has only been recently supporting this declarative syntax to populate your data catalogs and do health checks inside your pipelines and actually expressly like engineer a pipeline and code. Um, Palantir has been doing it for a long time and it shows they have a much more robust offering here. Scheduling, both platforms support scheduling. Um, Palantir is way more robust though because in the data syncs you can define behaviors like append strategies, um, how you want to append data, you can transform data directly in the scheduling setup uh, for your sync. Whereas Databricks, it's literally like pretty basic commands like day, how often do you want to run it and who do you want to alert if this thing fails? So both have the, the scheduling capabilities though, but <clears throat> uh, Foundry is the only one that has an enterprise grade offering, both for the declarative syntax and the scheduling. That said though, well, I shouldn't say enterprise grade, like really robust grade, but that said, like you can get what you know you need to get done in Databricks. I don't have any use cases that Databricks wouldn't fulfill. Um, that said, you know there's more work to do uh, on the engineering side, so your engineers are going to be doing a lot more work than they would say in Foundry. Um, alerts again, basic in Databricks, robust in Foundry. There's a lot more options for alerting. Health checks not included in Databricks to my knowledge, at least not the kind of health checks I'm talking about, which is the ability to go in like you can in Foundry and have a whole set of existing health checks that are common across all different types. Uh, if you watch my videos on health checks or Palantir's videos, their, their developer channel has a video on health checks, you'll see this incredibly robust um, way in which you can build all kinds of health checks out of box, no code involved, you just configure it and you're up and running. That's huge because the biggest problem with data pipelines is they fail. You know? And you want to know when they fail. You want to know how they're failing, what's going on. And so you're going to be doing a lot more work in Databricks to get those health checks, uh, to, to provide health checks and to provide visibility of those health checks. Uh, data lineage, both platforms support data lineage. However, Foundry's offering, again, is more robust. Monocle, which is the app you can use to go and view data lineage, has really advanced features to see the code producing each step, which is really cool. Uh, Databricks, you can see like the, the the schema, and you can see like if the health checks are passing. You can do the same thing in Monocle, but Monocle gives you a lot more options to view the code, to edit the code, do all kinds of advanced scheduling directly in Monocle and the lineage. So it's kind of like comparing apples and oranges. In fact, all of these things, like it's really like sort of comparing apples and oranges. Yes, they're they're there in Databricks. They're just not anywhere near as robust in Foundry. Additional information after the original recording too about some unique capabilities related to Foundry. And that is the unit tests that are in the online IDE. Those are run before your pipeline executes. And that's important because the fact that they're run before your pipeline executes allows you to find any defects uh, that could potentially arise between the data coming into that pipeline and errors that it might cause. And in the traditional approaches you see with Databricks is you do have to execute the pipeline in order for it to um, succeed or fail. And you don't want to be sitting there to find out your pipeline failed five hours uh, later because of some kind of ex you know um, issue with the data coming in. Maybe there's something that was is null, which should not be null, or maybe you're going to um, do these massive joins and it's going to blow up your pipeline. They have a tool which I'll leave a link to. Uh, there's a Stack Overflow article about how they can s use this tool called Synthesizer. It's a Python lib to synthesize data that can represent a lot of these edge cases. And you can run those tests before your pipeline fully runs against the target data. And that can uncover a ton of problems that you would not be able to discover otherwise. And what that ultimately leads to are more stable data pipelines. And the folks at Palantir have told me, you know, just that alone is one of the major reasons projects like Skywise succeed is because you can build really stable data pipelines by leveraging that capability. Applications, this is where the rubber really meets the road. Um, and this is the area where I think Foundry is just like completely differentiated from any other platform and really makes it like 
not even comparable at the end of the day. And we're, we're going to get into that right now. So visualizations. Databricks supports visualizations, but they're notebook driven visualizations. Basically, like you can use um, the graph tools inside Databricks to produce a visualization from a notebook cell. Um, it's an engineering tool, essentially. Like in Foundry, you have visualizations that are like anyone can work with, right? Like if you're a business, if you use business business intelligence software like Tableau, you'd be right at home. You don't even have to be that advanced. I mean, the, you don't even need to write SQL to do advanced segmentation and visualization of data. So Foundry, again, just way, way, way more advanced in the visualization department. Both platforms support dashboards, so Databricks does have the ability now to publish dashboards natively. Again, though, just nowhere near what, what Palantir can do through an application like Quiver. Quiver dashboards are pretty incredible. They have uh, Quiver itself is really incredible in the advanced um, visualizations you can build. Um, so, you know, it's yes, it's there. Are they equivalent in no way, shape, or form? Definitely the advantage going to Foundry. Data sharing, both platforms support sharing. However, Delta data sharing is pretty differentiated in the fact Foundry can't support it. I'm wondering how they do sharing of, um, you know, data tables. So, you know, it's it's interesting. I would I, I don't know enough about the capabilities of data sharing in Foundry to accurately compare it, but Delta data sharing capabilities are totally differentiated, and that's a huge advantage for Databricks. Sharing in Foundry, though, goes beyond... Um, data, right? You can share whole application suites. Like when you look at HyperAuto or Skywise, these are whole applications built in Foundry that are shareable, right? So it's not really comparable. Now, Databricks recently launched a marketplace where they announced they have similar capabilities. That said, the, the, the platform itself doesn't have similar capabilities, so the sharing capabilities are nowhere near equivalent. You can't build the same types of things in Databricks that you can build in, Palantir, or in Foundry. We'll get into that in a second. So both platforms support data sharing. Foundry has more advanced data sharing capabilities, both through sharing ontologies, through sharing data, through sharing applications. You know, so it's very, very different in that sense. Um, both are, sorry, uh, low to no co code tools. No, Databricks does not include low to no code application building tools like Workshop. Palantir does. This is a huge differentiator. Why? It removes the engineering bottleneck, right? So like, I don't need a team of React engineers anymore to go build custom data applications that actually do stuff like affect data and drive events in my system. I can use the low code tools in Foundry and have my product teams do that. You know, you can have business intelligence at a data analysts learn to use Workshop and start building really robust line of business applications that actually do things and ship value. That's totally differentiated. It does not exist in any other platform, to my knowledge, right? So, like, I don't know of another platform that does that. Foundry's totally differentiated here. Non-technical product suite. What does that mean? It's the big data OS. You know, Foundry comes with a whole lot of apps like Fusion, which is a spreadsheet interface for working with big data. Like, who the fuck else does that? No one. You know, like, you've, you've got Contour, which is a no-code application tool where you can visually build a data pipeline with huge with advanced visualization right and it's ultra performant like no one has that you know like the again getting into quiver totally differentiated data analytics suite that can do alerting that can allow you to do um date filtering and advanced segmentation and you can do drill down natively in quiver with no fucking code at all it's like um and there's also doc support there's forms like google forms you want to build google forms you can do that inside foundry chat is in gotham you know like i don't know if it's in foundry yet but i'm sure it's coming why does that matter it's because you're replacing all these one you're de-googling your stack but the other is that all these applications that used to be in data silos now exist in your big data os and your data mesh and you can analyze that data all that data becomes accessible so first party data that your organization is generating through using um things you would usually consider being in an office suite, those being in Foundry are hugely advantageous because now the data is accessible and you can analyze it. What about just, like, let's think of a basic thing here. Like, what about just doing analysis of chat, like, to do sentiment analysis across my company? That's kind of cool. Documents, like, w what entities are in my documents, you know? So these, these kind of things are super valuable from a data mining perspective for an organization if you want to produce a true uh, digital twin. And they also make every person at your company like 10 times more productive, right? Not needing to be a data engineer, which by the way, spoiler alert, like Databricks, you better be a data engineer or a data scientist. And you probably need to be a data engineer to really get the most out of the platform. <clears throat> um, that's a small segment of the people out there, you know? And they're some of the most highly paid and highly sought after. How the fuck is my organization supposed to do anything to realize, to, to do this digital transformation, extract value out of this platform if I don't have people to staff it, 
right? So that's an actual big concern. That is, in my mind, what's driving Foundry in the marketplace. That's, to me, when I think of Foundry versus Databricks, I think, like, really the thing that differentiates Foundry is that every actor in my organization be productive in a big data stack and they don't need to be a data engineer versus a platform like Databricks where they absolutely need to be a data engineer. And they're going to be solving distributed systems problems and they're going to be wrangling data a lot and dealing with dependency management and dealing with all these other things. And they, they need to know how to work in Spark. They need to know SQL, SQL really well. Like In Foundry, you absolutely do not. And you can build really robust things like full-blown line of business applications that do stuff and actually ship value. Well, that's pretty awesome. That removes the engineering bottleneck. That allows me to achieve digital transformation and to move at the speed of the data stream where non-technical users can make highly technical decisions. Hugely differentiated, and it can't be understated how important that is. So what's the verdict? <clears throat> um, I tried to narrow this down into three things that I could reason about that would really define my decision making at a business level. Uh, the f affordable and accessible are hugely important to me. Um, the reason is, is like, one, as I don't work for a large organization, we're very budget conscious, especially in this market. So affordability is massive. And um, the, the, the trick with Foundry is like a lot of the commitment to pricing is unknown. It's upfront. Um, and you, you are guarant you're basically guaranteeing a certain amount of spend with Databricks. I could spin it up or down or cancel it at any time. I'm not super worried about where my costs go. Do I expect to spend a lot of money on the platform? Of course, compute's not cheap. So, you know, you're going to be spending money, but even by their own benchmarks and my anecdotal experience, it's going to be way, way cheaper than Foundry. Uh, and that's important to me as an organization that is a business level concern that sort of trumps a lot of the other concerns that um, are more engineering focused. Accessibility, it's a, like all it's available today. I can try it. All of the documentation is there. There's a lot of uh, community around Databricks, so plenty of support. There's, um, all you know, Foundry has public documentation available. There is a community uh, growing around Foundry and Stack Overflow, but Databricks is way, 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 way further ahead, which means the platform is just more accessible. You can wrap your arms around it. You can understand it. You can get certified in it without being a customer. So that whereas Foundry certification, you have to be a customer in order to be get certified. So th that's another big one, and it's a business level concern. It's not, um, it's not about the developer experience and. We'll get into that in a second about um, where that falls. But so accessibility and affordability, those are the two kind of primary um, things I look at. After that, I'm thinking about this for everyone piece. And what is for everyone? That means like it's not just for scientists and engineers, right? And that for everyone piece is super important because it's basically most of my organization is not scientists or engineers. And those are the people that actually need to make decisions. And Foundry is the only platform that gives those people the tools to make data-driven decisions at the speed of the data stream. And that's where the value is extracted, right? So like there's no value, business value, extracted from Databricks, right? The business value comes downstream later when your decision makers and your the people that make up your organization can actually do something meaningful with the data, which requires a whole host of application tools that are generally today bespoke, but that Foundry has generalized and made accessible to um, just about anyone in your org who can use a BI or analytics tool. So that for everyone piece means I can actually extract value out of Foundry. And this makes this a very tough decision. So it really becomes how much value can I expect to extract out of my data? And that'll often inform my decision about affordability and accessibility. Because if, if I can you know extract millions of dollars worth of value out of my data, uh, that more than pays for the Foundry platform and makes me a huge amount of revenue and modernizes my organization at the same time, and, you know, and capture that value in a relatively short amount of time. That's huge. And so I think that that this is really um, Palantir's secret that they realize that in order for a big data platform to be meaningful, the non-technical people need to be able to make decisions with it and extract value from the data. And they're the only company, in my knowledge, that has figured that out. All these other companies rely on third parties to provide plugins or engineering teams to build custom software that run on top of what you know the the data platform that they've created and that just that model isn't working uh, for a large portion of the industry and th i think that's a huge reason we have such high failure rates and and a lot of it is that you know you have to put a lot of work into product engineering to create tools that actually allow you to get value from the data right like if you're a product person out there think about the type of software that would generalize that use case 
that's what Palantir did the last over the last decade. And they had a lot of benefit of working with uh, governments because they got huge focus group research out of that as well. So I think that they have figured out on a, on a very artistic level um, what makes good product that can allow customers who are non-technical to make data-driven decisions. And so huge, huge plus in the, the Palantir uh, side of the column. So again, this, this really comes down to do you have problems we're solving that will more than pay for the cost of foundry and really allow your organization to scale, right, to this next level that you're trying to get to? So like to me, that might not be everyone, but really at the end of the day, it's a huge portion of businesses out there. I think a massive number of people can generate, or massive number of businesses can ger- generate tremendous value from using the tools inside Foundry. And just to bookend this really quickly, um, you know, affordable and accessible should be easy problems for Palantir to solve, whereas for everyone is an incredibly hard problem to solve that could take years and years of work by very talented engineers at Databricks. And it goes beyond technical limitations, um, building good product like what's in Foundry um, to solve problems for a non-technical user base is also art. You know, it's not just science, it's also art that you have to have the vision and the experience of how non-technical users experience this kind of software. I'm not exactly sure Databricks has that in their DNA. So for Palantir, they, they have the harder problem solved, but at the same time, it makes you wonder and question like, why is the platform not affordable on the level of Databricks? Why is it not accessible like Databricks? It questions your, your um, sort of confidence in the platform as a developer. Typically when you see things like that, you go, oh, it must be riddled with bugs or it must not be you know, scalable. It needs a support engineer. It's not a real platform yet. So I think they need to fix these two things. And I think they need, and especially because it will give developers like me a lot more confidence when making the case to make a large expenditure based on estimated savings and value the platform will deliver, if it's affordable and if it's accessible, it doesn't give the developers like their radar goes up, you know, they're not, they're going, okay, there's something wrong with this technology. So I think fixing this both from uh, a broad based market adoption point of view where you can get more developers in the field who are certified in it, and from the point of view of just public perception on why your platform is closed and not affordable. So I think both of these two things are absolutely critical to fix and to understand that when people are making decisions, especially in this market, the the affordability might be number one. And finally, uh, I just want to state that it's not um, Databricks or Foundry. Uh, Both these Foundry in Foundry, Databricks is a first class citizen, so you can manage the models and data sets that um, Databricks is producing right inside of Foundry, and they can absolutely interoperate. So. If you wanna take advantage of Delta, you need to take advantage of Delta and, and Databricks' um, structured streaming capabilities, by all means, you can do that. And if you're, especially also if you are if you already have teams who are working on this platform and you've already produced a lot of work product or they're already trained and certified and you wanna leverage Foundry's um, you know, low to no code application tools for your product folks and your other non-te- non-technical folks, these two platforms absolutely interoperate. You can absolutely use them together. And I think there might be a lot of opportunity there for, for, for Palantir to think about like, how could they lower the cost of entry on those no code application tools and then allow companies to continue to use these other tools they either already have or um, you know, are, are, would prefer for certain use cases and maybe that brings their cost down, especially in the high, like where you're spending a lot of money on compute is typically in your data pipelines and in building your ML and uh, your ML models. So if they can bring the cost down there and realize savings for their customers, allow them to take advantage of the tools, which they already do. But if they could come up with some kind of market offering that was really meant to target the SMB space that way, maybe that would be a big win for them. But anyway, I don't see these as mutually exclusive options. And I could see use cases now where I would actually prefer Databricks over Foundry especially in cases where I'm doing streaming, like structured streaming. I hope you all enjoyed that head-to-head comparison between two industry titans. Um, I'll follow up with the folks from Palantir and maybe release a part two to this video, depending on what answers I can get back from them. And also, uh, Seattle Data Guy is going to be dropping his uh, thoughts on Foundry, um, his first usage impressions, pretty soon. So check out his channel. Be sure to go over there and subscribe to his channel if you haven't. He's got great insights on industry trends on these type of platform tools. 
And I'm hoping that him and I can do a deep dive discussion on this stuff, because I think two, the two of us could just geek out, get into the low-level technical details. I know his audience would really appreciate it, so I'll reach out to him and see if uh, I could go on his channel. Maybe we'll do like a real deep dive into some of the technical aspects of um, these two platforms. So stay tuned, people, and I'll see you next time.